All right, we don't, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so, thanks for joining us. Um, this is a opportunity to have a little more conversation with our plenary speaker, Dan Reed, and um, I'm very grateful to him for making this extra time. Uh, he's shared with us a very, um, very rich uh, overview of many things, and there's lots more to talk about. Um, I have a short list of maybe 30 questions um, that we could explore, um, and I know some of you probably have some questions too, and I wanna make some time for that, uh, and we've got a half hour. So um, I thought we'd just get started and uh, about, 20 minutes in, I'll um, open it up for you all. So I think the place I'd like to start a little bit is with the very compelling argument that you made that um, a lot of the locus of research is shifting away from government and towards private industry. Um, and particularly the, the control of the technical resources and infrastructure to drive that research. Um, I find myself pulled in multiple directions there because on the one hand, you can see the kind of investments that the um, uh, federal research organizations have made in things like exascale computing, which are really, you know, after a decade just now turning into uh, tangible reality. Um, I know that when they do the supercomputer ratings, for example, um, a number of the uh, commercial players don't even bother to submit anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with how to square those investments with the investments that the tech folks are making. Um, I also am wondering a little bit about where you see, you know, the future of na national computational resources writ large as they are funded and made available as genuinely national research resources. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, that's a whole uh, multi-hour talk in its, <laughs> its own right. So, I mean, I have mixed emotions about the, that locus shift as well. And in part, I view it um, not so much that the private sector um, is stealing the show, uh, maybe more that the government and academia is leaving its candy on the ground. <laughs> Um, and I say that because, well, first let me address the narrow issue about scientific computing. And I realize this is a bit far afield for this audience, so I won't belabor the point. But the model that the U.S. has had about procuring supercomputers is failing. In fact, I was just part of a National Academy study that was chaired by Kathy Yellick from Berkeley that said, what we're doing ain't working anymore, folks. It's going to take a different model. Uh, and the Office of Science at DOE, I'm part of another committee that's grappling with that right now. The first study was looking at computing for the nuclear weapons lab, so how to do, uh, assure the, uh, the nuclear weapons stockpile, but the issues are the same both places and they spill over into NSF uh, and the other federal agencies as well. But it's related to the core issue, which is, if you think about buying these days a leading edge supercomputer that would be used for computational science, round numbers, those things cost three to six hundred million dollars, depending on um, the day of the week and what you're after. If you only buy one of those every three to five years, you don't have much influence in the marketplace anymore because the folks who are building the AI infrastructure at the hyperscalers they're spending more than that every quarter as opposed to every five years. And so that's one issue, just uh, financial influence. The other is that the control of the ecosystem is also moving. So <clears throat> if you're a Google or a Microsoft or a Facebook or an Amazon, yes, you buy hardware from the computer vendors, but you're increasingly building your own. Um, because you actually have more money and influence than the computer vendors do, and that hardware is captive. You can buy services atop it, but you can't actually buy the hardware. 
And so the whole question, uh, and, and this is broadly true about AI infrastructure as well, is what kind of public-private partnership will be appropriate going forward? And my guess is that it will have to be sold if we want to have that true partnership at a higher level than a federal agency engagement because money alone won't do the deal. It will have to be done based on an argument that it's in the country's interest as a different kind of partnership. But there are, there are issues there. But the, the broader issue, so that's, the, that's sort of the end of the scientific computing spiel. Let me go back to your core issue, which is, you know, if I look at the locus of influence, as one of the questioners rightly asked when I was talking, we need academia and the government at the table because they do some things that the private sector cannot. After all, academia is, from, in many cases, arguably most cases, maybe all, its most valuable product is people. We train a new generation of talent that goes into the workforce. So that's really important that it be educated in techniques that match what industry wants. But academia, other than a small number of companies, in every domain, not just computing, is the fount of basic research. It's true in biomedicine, it's true in engineering, uh, it's true in science writ large. We need those people driven by curiosity, not just by the narrower focus of what will drive um, business outcomes, right? Because, um, and that's both our strength and our weakness, because at least a, a business, Every day, if you're a public company, every day the market tells you how you're doing and is a very clear answer. Um, and whereas in academia, we have a much more diverse set of reward metrics, frankly, some of which are cross purposes to one another at times, uh, which is our own set of issues. But we do some longer term thinking that companies can't afford to do. And it's that basic research that turns out sometimes 10, 20, 30 years later to be the secret sauce. And we can't afford uh, to sacrifice that. So my worry in some sense and why I was earlier talking about the National Defense and Education Act is that's a story that isn't 500 million or a billion here. That's a number that is in large multiples of billions, maybe even upwards of a trillion over a period of years. And how we have that conversation about the appropriate level of investment is difficult. And I'll just say this last thing and then I'll stop. If you look at what happened uh, as part of the two mini buses that were passed to finally get us a federal budget, those were all in the end an outgrowth of the negotiation that happened between President Biden, or among President Biden, Senator Schumer, um, and uh, Representative McCarthy back last summer. And pretty much every federal research agency is either flat or was cut as part of that budget compromise. Uh, and if you talk to the appropriators who had to do that, they did not want to do that. But the roll down of allocations uh, in in DC speak, the 302A and the 302B budget allocations, they were given not enough money to satisfy multiple pressing needs. In the case of, of NSF, for example, uh, NSF's budget is set by the so-called Commerce, Justice, and Science Committee, CJS, in both the House and the Senate. They had to make difficult choices between local policing, weather forecasting, the FBI, and science funding. Those are all kind of important to us folks, but there wasn't enough money to go around. While we're on the topic of money, um, let, let me shift to a slightly different area that um, I worry a lot about. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the way we fund, the way we structure costs for people for research in academia, it's had a pretty um, extractive quality to it, especially for junior researchers. And we've seen quite a lot of pushback on that in very recent times, the unionization of graduate researchers and postdocs, 
um, <clears throat> general calls, I think, for, you know, living wages for postdocs and um, uh, entry um, researchers. Uh, that all makes sense, but the <clears throat> net effect of it is it runs up the costs pretty substantially of doing research. You, you can buy less research yep. per dollar, if you will. Um, how do you see that playing out? Well, it's a, it's a real issue. Look, any, all of us who went to graduate school knew we took a vow of genteel poverty, right? That was, you know, at some level was always part of the deal. But when I see graduate students having to go to the food bank because they don't have enough money to buy food, uh, or they can't afford housing and there's housing insecurity, those are real equity issues. So I am very sympathetic to that, that reality. And so some equilibration is entirely equitable um, and ethically appropriate. But Cliff, you're absolutely right. The consequence of that in a budget envelope that is arguably not keeping pace with inflation uh, what that means is there are fewer graduate students and postdocs. And I had a version of this conversation with the executive committee research officers of the AAU uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, there isn't any way out of that box uh, unless we find more money. Now, I will say that I think there is another issue that we also need to own up to, and there have been multiple academy studies that looked at this over the years. In, in too many cases, I think, we have uh, unfortunately not lived up to our own principles. We have treated graduate students as inexpensive labor to advance the career of the faculty member, as opposed to recognizing that our role is mentors, uh, and supporters of people who are building their own career. And that power dynamic affects the working conditions as well. That's a non-monetary issue, but it is a very real one. And there are a variety of ways we could think about changing that, but all would require us to embrace a bit of culture shift. And I'll float an example. Um, in a net zero model, one could move more money out of research grants and more of it into graduate fellowships um, because then um, that lets the graduate students be more free agents in terms of seeking uh, an advisor relationship and might well affect some of those power dynamics. That's just one possibility, and I know that has its own downsides uh, as well. Every change, you know, it's like jelly in the tree. Something is always going to drive change. but. The root of the issue is, uh, I would say more broadly, our societal disinvestment. You know, if you look at pretty much every public higher education institution and their sources of funding, uh, you know, which, you know, are tuition, state funding, uh, philanthropy, the first order, and yes, research, and research loses money, right? We should also be honest about that. We, that we don't do it to make money. But in every one of those public institutions, pretty much in every state, the budgets are an X curve, which is to say that tuition became a larger source of revenue than state funding did in almost every case. Um, and that has its own set of social negatives that uh, affect equity and access. But it does speak to how do we make that case that higher education is a societal investment in the future as opposed to a tax to be paid. Um, because I think that's another issue. I will tell one anecdote. I had a conversation once with a state legislator and I said, you know, what we do is really important. And they said, I agree, it is really important. You are our number four priority. Our number well, bear me out. Number one priority is, is mandatory social service spending. Um, number two is prisons. And number three is K-12. You're right after that as number four. Uh, and I said, well, you know, let me sort of put the, the dollars on the bottom line. If uh, you think about what happens in prison, um, you build a social network, you learn some skills, neither of which may not be particularly valuable in society, and it's really expensive to house prisoners. 
that higher education, we give people a social network, we give them skills, we do so much more cheaply, and all of those things are more valuable in society. And the legislator looked at me and said, yeah, that's all true, you're number four. <laughs> How do you beat that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish I knew. Yeah. Uh, I also went out and talked to a, a, a local legislator and showed all the ways that federal tax dollars from research were being spent in their district, you know, buying services from companies and, you know, to support the research enterprise and all of this. And I'm like, look at what's happening because we're doing research. And the person who is a small government um, rural uh, legislator said, how do I stop this? And I thought, I got nothing. I got nothing to respond to that. <laughs> Let me bounce over to a <clears throat> rather different um, area for um, what perhaps will be the last of uh, questions from me that we have time for. Um, <clears throat> cybersecurity. Uh, we should get some. Yeah, somehow it feels like um, <clears throat> we're losing this battle in a lot of ways. Um, it, it's, a, it's an area where it's much harder to play defense than offense, just by its nature. Um, do you think it's gonna get better? Um, are you optimistic? Um, how, do, how do you think the landscape there is gonna change? I'm not sure, honestly, I have a whole lot of insight. You're right, it is asymmetric warfare. Um, and um, if you're playing defense, you only need to lose once, right, before you've been penetrated. Uh, and so much of these issues are related to human behavior and social dynamics. Yeah, there are technology issues, but we are the primary cause of, of cybersecurity problems. I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, because obviously it affects everything from the security of personal data, PII, um, government records, and uh, also some pretty serious national security issues because state actors are at play in that space as well. I don't know, but I, I share your fears and I don't have a good answer to that. All I can say is if there's any history of asymmetric warfare is that eventually something changes, either the sociology or the technology, and there's a rebalancing, but I don't know what that will be. Interesting. Um, let, let me follow on to something closely related. One of the things that I've thought about a great deal over the last um, five or six years, particularly, um, as we went through the experience with the pandemic, is resilience, uh, which is somewhat related to cybersecurity, but also related to our ability to deal with all kinds of other unexpected yep. events and disasters. Um, I wonder what the thinking is about the resilience of our research enterprise. Is there any deliberate thinking going on about that in the circles you operate in? You mean resilience and its sustainability or? Resilience to various kinds of unexpected disasters, attacks, problems, disruptions. I mean, it, it's clear it is in, the continuity of that enterprise is important in some fundamental way although we don't, I believe, have a great handle on exactly what parts are critical. So the one that worries me worse, uh, most is the diversity of our talent base along multiple axes. So one is if you look uh, in a lot of our fields, the overwhelming majority of our graduate students are international. Now, I meant what I said earlier, mm -hmm. that is one of the country's superpowers, that we attract talent from around the world and we have to protect that in the face of the political complexities around immigration policy. You know, I'd like to see our international grad students after appropriate checks get a green card pretty much automatically if they want to stay in the U.S. Uh, and many members of Congress believe that. But here's the, the two things that worry me. One is we are critically dependent on that talent flow from a small number of countries. Now, I'm old enough to remember when, and some of you are too, when um, as a consequence of uh, 
what happened in Iran, um, we banned all uh, Iranian graduate mm -hmm. students from the country uh, and forced them to leave the country in a very small window. And so the geopolitics with respect to China, I'd invite you to think about what happens if we found ourselves in that situation where there was a ban on um, Chinese graduate students. The effect on our research enterprise would be catastrophic. So that's the geopolitical worry. The flip side of that is, relates to, um, Cliff, your earlier question about living wages and financial support. How do we increase the numbers and diversity of our domestic research talent base? And I'll just cite a couple of numbers from the recent indicators report. We wanted to achieve, um, in terms of equity, numbers, equal to the population, we'd roughly have to double the number of women in STEM, and we'd have to quadruple or quintuple the number of people of color mm -hmm. uh, in order to achieve population equity. So we're leaving talent on the floor, uh, and that's a, an issue. But the broader issue is how do we increase uh, the absolute numbers? Um, both because there is a shortage of talent um, and also because of some of these geopolitical risks. That's the one that keeps me awake at night. It's one that the National Science Board is spending a lot of shoe leather on in the Hill talking to people about the risks and the, and the opportunities here, you know, um, and both what's the right thing to do ethically, but what's the right thing to do from a geopolitical perspective as well. And that's why I said it's not about... Um, uh, China in the sense of we don't want those students here. We absolutely do, but it's how we grow the domestic base to go with it. But those two things are intertwined in some complex geopolitical ways. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity in the last few minutes to open this up for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, there are some microphones there. Please step up. Um, if you don't, I have my five-hour list. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you. Shima Wang from Northwestern University. And I'm very pleased you mentioned the topic about China not only once, also particularly in your early speech as well, you used the new format of the Cold War. So my question for you is, is this Cold War avoidable. Uh, you did not sound very optimistic about the future about this Cold War. One thing I feel particularly frustrating or disappointing of seeing the U.S. take policy towards China is all the policy appears to be trying to figure out how to slow China down, not how to figure out we can run faster. So let me hear your thoughts about what is the issue you're thinking. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the way that you uh, prevail in any global competition is being better at what you're doing than the competition is. You put your finger on what I would describe as the political divide in D.C. Um, between the two parties about what is the appropriate response uh, to what is clearly a, um, a rising competition uh, with China. I mean, I will also say, in fairness, if you look at what China is doing, uh, they are increasing their percentage of R&D, uh, of GDP invested in R&D, and that's a publicly stated policy. And so that does speak to how do you uh, outcompete. It's also a publicly stated policy of China to de-risk dependence on U.S. technology. And I can't blame China at all. I mean, if I were them, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, you want to control your own destiny, but those are, that's what great powers do. That's what rivalries have always been since we've had great nation states. But you're right, the way that you win in this story is you do it better, right? So that uh, people want to be part uh, of what we're trying to do. Uh, and so there's also obviously, a, you know, as I said, a, a proxy battle going on for global influence around the world, just as there has always been in different contexts. So, but you're right, you, you, the way you do it is, is you, you, you do the right thing and you do it better. Hi. Yep, there we can we hear you, yep. 
Uh, hi, Wing Coles, uh, Princeton. I have a question, kind of turning to the domestic for a minute, um, and I want to ask you about the K-12 question. So the numbers are really disturbing um, around our achievement. You're talking about investments into the future, and we're already apparently number four behind number three. Um, so it's a small end, but I can say from my own experience in a number of different states with a number of different public school systems, um, it's not for the lack of trying, right? It is all STEM all the time, um, especially in middle school and high school. So I guess my question to you is, what do we do differently, right? We, you know, it, do we keep doing the same thing that's not working? Are people thinking about how do we adjust how we teach? Is it more holistic? Is it more focused on learning into the future? I'm just curious about what might be going on because yeah, the numbers are really disheartening. They are, and I don't think, obviously, there's no single band-aid that's gonna fix this problem, as you rightly noted. You know, I had a slide in an earlier version of this talk that had a, an old story from uh, Carl Sagan, and he said, you go talk to first graders, and they're just bubbling over with ideas, like, why do we have toes? How old is the world? You know, what's, why is the moon round? It's like, these are great questions. And he said, and then you go talk to 12th graders, and it's like crickets. And he said, something horrible happened in between, and it wasn't just puberty. Uh, and so, I, to me, the issue has always been, how do you reward the curiosity? Because I think those of us in this room are probably the exceptions to the rule, in the sense that we were sufficiently determined that we resisted conformity, and we kept asking questions long after people really wanted us to be quiet uh, and, and just nod. Uh, and so how you, you f fuel that spirit of curiosity is a core thing. You know, there's an old quote attributed to um, um, Plutarch who said that a, a mind is not a, uh, a vessel to be filled, it's a fire to be lit. You know, and we all know that if someone uh, is inspired, they will move heaven and earth to learn, right? Because it's that curiosity that drives it. But when we squeeze that out of the system, we got a different problem. Now, that's philosophy. What do we do about it? Well, the other thing I would say that's pernicious about the data I showed is there's other data that says those places that have the poorest performing students, they also have the least experienced teachers. And so there's a perpetuation of challenges there. We all know that with local schools disproportionately funded from property taxes, that that inequity perpetuates across generations. I mean, the poor and underrepresented are the ones that most need education. If you're from a wealthy, powerful family, you gotta work really hard to screw up, um, even if you are, are a, a disaffected student. So, all of those things, uh, I mean, they're good and bad things about the distributed K-12 education system. You know, French education minister once said to me, it's 10 o'clock on Tuesday, I know what every kid in France is studying right now. Um, but there's no easy fix. Uh, I think it's gonna be a whole collection of things. But I, the reason I, I went to the NDEA uh, is because and there were bad things about it. New math is a whole other sorry story about K-12 education. But we did elevate the conversation and we tried some different things. And I think we're gonna have to do that because we're just leaving way too much talent behind. And I, that's not much of an answer, it's more of a plea for ideas because as I said, the science board's spending a lot of time on this issue. Not because NSF has a lot of money compared to the Department of Education, but because we know we need STEM talent in this country and we gotta try something because what we're doing now is not working. Let's take one last question. Yeah, quick question, long answer, I'm sure. Uh, Scott Walter, San Diego State University. <laughs> so ACRL, sorry, ARL, ARL and CNI are working on these AI scenarios. We're gonna talk about them later today. And in those scenarios, when they talk about education, they talk about skills building and they talk about um, you know, concrete skills related to AI, um, stackable credentials, I might say, and so on. And there's a lot of discussion of skills building and there's a lot of discussion of workforce development and there's a lot of discussion of the impact of AI and workforce. Where in all this, going back to your Plutarch, where in all this is the role of humanistic inquiry 
and ensuring that there's that room for exploration while people are being exposed to certain technology skills. I think that's one of the great conundra. The downside is education is one of the most labor-intensive industries that we have um, in terms of number of people invested to output. And, you know, if you look at the power of technology in all kinds of other domains, it's been automation, uh, automation and increasing productivity. I'm not suggesting that students are widgets to be stamped out. Don't misunderstand. But I do think that is part of the opportunity. The other opportunity is, goes back to what I said in part of uh, response to the previous question. I think to the extent to which the hope of AI in this context, and not about skills, but about passion and curiosity, because that cuts across the arts and the humanities just as it, much as it does the sciences, is feeling a personal connection uh, in that sense of dynamic response and interaction might be the, the opportunity. But I think it is also about, as I said, that sense that the possible is there and that you are encouraged. All of us, I dare say, if we were to take a poll, each of us can name a teacher or two at some point in our lives that was transformative in our worldview. And it's that that you need to try to capture and expand because, you know, a lot of doing anything is believing that you can. Now, believing doesn't mean you can do anything, otherwise I'd be a retired NBA basketball star now. <laughs> Not all dreams come true. Um, but that notion of encouragement and feeding the passion is what matters. And all of us, I used to tell students who went off to teach Look, by the time you're in graduate school, you have a finely honed sense of who is a good teacher and who's not. You walk into lecture in the first five minutes, you know. This person I would love to listen to, this one is gonna be a slog. But just because you can recognize it doesn't mean you can do it. Uh, but that doing it is the part that, that mix of human, and technology, if we can marry those in the right way, there's opportunity. But we've been struggling with this issue for decades of technology-mediated education, and I don't believe that AI is gonna be a panacea. It's not gonna be a secret sauce that cracks this code, but it can help, I think, if applied correctly. It can also do damage if applied incorrectly. And I fear we must leave it there. Dan, we're deeply in your debt for all of this time today and for all that you've shared with us. I hope you won't be a stranger in future. Oh, it's a delight to be here, and I'll make one final plea. You know, as we struggle to address these challenges in D.C., ideas are always welcome. So if you have ideas about things that we can do to, to drive policy change and affect some of these issues, you know how to find me. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. But thanks for the invitation, Cliff. I'm really grateful.